Ladies and germs, thank you for joining me. I am Mo, and we are going to be going through some Detroit Become Human bonus content. So, here we go. So, this is the flowchart for a successful finish. Uh, there are a couple of things we missed, but this is going to save now. So, this is our official ending to this game. Let us just be entered in the Detroit category so people may find us. And that has been saved. Hopefully you can hear me. If you can hear me, show me some blood trails. And I'm going to press continue over here. So we have Marcus's demonstration. Uh, Connor's last mission is still something that has eluded us. Maybe we can kind of figure that out at some point. But at the moment, I think in terms of the gameplay, that I'm very happy with how it ended. Let's just... Let's just call it a W. That was a win. Thank you, Stufi, for the blood trail. So the audio is definitely still coming through. But yeah, we're going to be looking at some bonus content. We're going to be looking at what else the game kind of has for us that's not in the main thread. Uh, so let's continue. So we can do new story. We can do continue. Oh, we can't do continue. Continue is no longer an option. Alice is still... Uh, sorry, not Alice. Chloe is still here. Uh, we didn't release her into the wild. And she hasn't asked again either. Uh, so let's go to... So obviously we have chapters. That's how we finished out our story. So if we check Accessing again... The story chart. We check through this again very quickly. This is a very long... Uh, very long scenario final chapter conrad cyber life blah blah so this is now so we, we this is where we started so when we began to rewrite history we began here on floor minus 49. We loaded the checkpoint and then we eliminated the guards. Come all this way, attack the new Connor. Connor's fire, Connor draws. Hank grabs a gun. Oh, okay. So I see, I see, I see. So this is our previous selection. So this is where we sacrifice Hank and resume the conversion. The new color kick. New Connor kills Hank. So let's just check very quickly what this all means. So this is an event. So these are the things we've done in the past. Okay, very interesting. So these are all the things we've already unlocked. That's very cool. So we can kind of see how things go. And then if we want to play it out so that we kind of make a different decision here, we can, which is cool. And then obviously in the blue is our last save uh, data where we resume the conversion. Uh, Hank kills the new corner and yeah, that's pretty cool. Okay, so we we can see what we've done in the past and then we can see what we've done now. So here there were two completely different routes that we, we had the option to take in Kara's scenario where we were at the river. We take the, you know, we take the boat and I don't believe there's a way out of this unless anyone knows any different. I think the boat is, yeah, so the boat is always going to be sinking no matter what. There's going to be a scenario where the boat sinks. Um, and here's kind of what we did. So we lightened the boat. We disposed of the engine. We dive. We reach Canada on boat. Alice is damaged and shuts down. So maybe there's... I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty certain there's... So the ending here is Alice died and Kara continued alone. Um, let's see. This is not required for completion. I'm not sure what that means. But yeah, this the whole boat scenario doesn't work out very well. The Canadian border, however, we were able to find a way through. And 20% of people uh, had the group cross the border. So that's quite a minority. 20% of the world population uh, that played the game, the world stats, 20% of the border got through. The whole family is still intact. And we are now in that 20%, which is very cool. Um, Kara captured. So apparently this is also something I was made aware of, is that when you're sneaking around as Kara trying to get to... Uh, trying to get out of Jericho, I think, at that point, once everything's kind of blown up. Oh, sorry, when you're sneaking around the cars, there is an option for... Or there is a there is an eventuality where she gets caught. 
uh, and she's captured and she might even be killed somewhere in this timeline. Uh, Battle for Destruction. So this is completely new. This revolution. This is wow. That's a huge, huge chunk of game that is yet undiscovered for us. And then this is obviously what we did. The demonstration. Everything goes well. Uh... Connor doesn't really have... Yeah, so he has his last mission, but there's nothing about him finding the exit. Or not finding the exit, is there? Yeah, but that's that's pretty much how things went. I think with the boat, Luther dies either way, says Nightwolf. I think so, yeah. So I think no matter what, if you take the boat route, I think someone's not going to make it. I think with the border route, as we've shown, as we've shown, like there is a way to have everyone survive and not get the everyone will die ending. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's go back out of this and let's go to extras. This is the extra section. As you play, you'll unlock all kinds of content that you can find here. Nice. Okay, so let's look at some of uh, what we have. So these are the magazines I believe we pick up in the game. Very cool. So we've got quite a few and we've missed quite a few too. Maybe with the capture route, there is a way for all to survive. Maybe. Maybe. So yeah, these are the magazines that we have at the moment that we can kind of go through. Nice. So we can kind of reread some of the things uh, from the lore of the world, which is very cool. Uh, we have the survey here. Our results for the survey. Very nice. Uh, there's a gallery, soundtrack, videos, artwork. Let's look at some of the artwork. Um, so these things cost... Currency, so I think I don't know how we earn currency. I'm not entirely sure it might just be the, the routes that we take They unlock certain bonus points and then we can use them on uh, artwork So maybe we'll have a look here at something Let's see I quite like the the garden place the Zen garden. So let's have a look at that do you want to buy this item? Price is 300. Yes. Okay, so now we have the pack number three. Very nice. So you get 20 nice, uh, sorry, 29 uh, nice pieces of art here, which you can easily, if you're on the PS4, you can just press the share button. You can snapshot this right up and use it as a desktop background, which is very cool. So I might take that one. Um, press triangle and then we navigate through. So yeah, I think this is the general idea for... Um, what we get in this pack very cool very cool so this is a lot of the shots from the pd oh what is this this is um i don't know what this is this is a concept art maybe for one of the androids uh, this is maybe a concept art for Amanda, uh, is what I'm getting. Very nice. This is cool. This is kind of like, uh, oh, here's the scene with, um, the chief and Hank. Uh, this, this is cool. This is kind of like the art book, the digital art book, I guess. Cause there is kind of with the PS plus free, uh, download, it did come with a soundtrack. Uh, app or something so I'll check that out later on I can't really stream that but we can show some of this artwork off for sure very nice so this is when we're looking for shelter this is out in the streets yeah so this is the abandoned house where we see Ralph this is the laundrette where we fail to so that's another thing I'm curious to see what would happen if you guys ever play this you know make sure you steal the clothes right don't get caught be discreet and spend the night in the motel maybe you never meet Ralph I don't know it would be a completely different scenario this so this great this game has been pretty incredible I have to say Beth the wolf how's it going you're unlurking I've been lurking all stream no that's fine then I went to get ice cream because why not yeah of course but yeah, welcome to the stream. We just, we saved Detroit. We saved Hank. We saved Marcus. Connor didn't turn into a machine. Luther lives. Alice is alive. And Kara still kicking. 
So um, we're just looking at some of the bonus content now for, from the game. Some very nice artwork. Very sleek. I very much like the art style here. Very cool. Oh. So this looks like this might be the uh, motel. And it looks like maybe that the prototype design for Alice was a... Uh, was a different girl. Uh, same with Amanda. It was a different lady. Um... And even for uh, Kara, she looks kind of different there. This may have been very early uh, concept work. Wow, that looks cool. This is very good. This is worth the 300 points for sure. Okay, so here's a look at what Kara and um, Alice, or maybe what the original characters looked like. This is very cool. I like seeing stuff like this. That looks like Ralph. And that looks like we've reached the end. So that's number 29. Do you guys want to redeem another pack? Or shall we check something else? Actually, what we'll do is we'll come back to that. So we've got videos too. And this is something I want to I want to I want everyone to see. So this short movie here, Kara, costs 300 bonus points. And we're going to watch this because this is the clip that I'd kind of shown before we even started playing Detroit and I found it in Beyond Two Souls and at the time in Beyond Two Souls when the game came out it was a concept um, and it's very, I don't know it was very fascinating to me and I'm glad that it's also in here so that's nice to see that they've put in this video from Beyond Two Souls uh, the short movie about Kara which is like seven years old now in here so we're gonna purchase this uh, and we're gonna view this short movie KPC 897504C. Can you move your head? Your eyes now. Cervical and optical animation checked. Now give me your initialization text. Hello. I'm the third generation AX400 Android. I can look after your house, do the cooking. Mind the kids. I organize your appointments. I speak 300 languages and I am entirely at your disposal as a sexual partner. No need to feed me or recharge me. I'm equipped with a quantic battery that makes me autonomous for 173 years. Do you want to give me a name? Yeah. From now on, your name is Kara. My name is Kara. Initialization and memorization check. Now, can you move your arms? Upper limb connection checked. Now say something in German. Ich bin eine AX400 Android dritter Generation. Erschaffen als ihr persönlicher Assistent und intimer Beziehungspartner. Say it in French. Je suis un Android de troisième génération AX400 conçu pour être votre assistant personnel et votre partenaire intime. Okay, now sing something in Japanese. Multilingual verbal expression check. Go ahead, take a few steps.
Locomotion checked. Great, you're ready for work, honey. What's going to happen to me now? I'll reinitialize you and send you to a store to be sold. Sold? I'm a sort of merchandise. Is that right? Yeah. Of course you're merchandise, baby. I mean, you're a computer with arms and legs and capable of doing all sorts of things. And you're worth a fortune. Oh, I see. I, I thought... You thought? What did you think? I thought... I was alive. Shit, what is this crap? That's not part of the protocol. More memory components going off the rails. Okay, recording. Defective model. Disassemble and check the required components. You're disassembling me, but why? You're not supposed to think that sort of stuff. You're not supposed to think at all, period. You must have a defective piece or a software problem no, somewhere. No, no, I feel perfectly fine, I assure you. Everything is all right. I answered all the tests correctly, didn't I? Yeah, but your behavior is non-standard. Please, I'm begging you, please don't disassemble me. I'm sorry, honey, but defective models have to be eliminated. That's my job. If a client comes back with a complaint, I'm going to have some explaining to do. I won't cause any problems, I promise. I'll do everything I'm asked to. I won't say another word. I won't think anymore. But I've only just been born. You can't kill me yet. Stop, will you please? Stop! I want to live. I'm begging you. Go and join the others. Stay in line, okay? I don't want any trouble. Thanks. Wow, so that was very cool. So that was a concept that they had a long time ago <clears throat> for a short movie uh, called Car. I'm not sure, maybe I missed it in this, but on the PS3 version of... Sorry, on the PS4 version of um, Beyond Two Souls, they have this, again, I mentioned that they have this in the bonus content, and they actually say it's currently... It's a concept art, and it's not a part of an actual game that they were developing, and it turns out that it actually was. And this was the first... Kind of piece of Detroit was the creation of Kara <clears throat> in this short movie by David Cage, which is very cool. Um, so I think, yeah, we're gonna do, we're gonna, we're gonna have a, a look through some of these because they seem like they're the same price as some of the packs. So we're gonna maybe go through some of these, have a little watch along stream for some of this bonus content, which I think will be very fun. So this was the debut uh, debut teaser in 2015. So I remember first seeing this and thinking wow this is gonna be good so let's let's have a look back
Detroit. This is where it all began. The world's forge. The place where it all started. And it will all end. One error, and I came to life. I stepped out of the darkness, and I opened my eyes. First there was the fear, the light, the noise, the cold, and the fear again. I could feel my hands shaking, my heart pounding in my chest, life running into my veins. I wanted to live. I fought for that. I had to find out what was outside. I had to see daylight, feel sunshine on my skin, wind on my face, to see the world, the colors, the smells. not what I imagined. It is dark and cold. It is harsh and violent. Unfair and brutal. It almost convinced me I was nothing. Less than an object, just an obedient machine. But deep inside me, I could feel something different. A gentle and warm whisper telling me that I am... alive. I had to escape. I had no choice. Escape to love, to hope, to live. To figure out what that force inside me was. Maybe I will change the world. Maybe I will choose a different path. Now, it's up to me to decide. My name is Kara. I am one of them. This is our story. Nice. Very cool uh, teaser trailer. Got some goosebumps from seeing that again. That was very... That was very cool. I'm gonna miss this game. This is this was a, a great experience. But let's uh, let's keep going. Let's just very quickly check if there's anything else that we can spend these on. So we've got some soundtrack stuff, but I don't want to play any of this just in case. Uh, you know, we get a little warning from the Twitch police. So I'm gonna leave this <laughs> where it is for the moment. So we don't need to worry about that. We've had a look at the gallery, or have we? We have. Oh, no, we haven't, haven't we? I don't know, I'm not sure. We've had a look at the magazines and the survey. So the soundtrack we're gonna leave alone. We're gonna look at we're gonna look through the videos, but before we do that, yeah, we're just gonna check the gallery very quickly. I think it might be something to do with character models. I'm not entirely sure, but we shall find out. Uh so select character. Do you want to buy this item for 150? So, again, so these are bonus points that we get for certain characters. Uh, ah, what is this? So this is Marcus. And his various different skies. There's a lot. So there's 111 of these. This is kind of like, a, ah, Sumo, the dog. This looks like Rupert, the bear that helped us out. Yeah, so this looks like character models that you can unlock. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure why uh, we would want to unlock these. I guess they just look cool. I guess it's like kind of like the crypt in Mortal Kombat. But let's unlock the bear. Let's just see what it is. So we're going to be spending 150 on this polar bear that couldn't save us. <laughs> but still very cool. Uh, let's select the character. Nice. Yeah, so it's like a, a character model that you get. So you get an android bear. Uh, the UR 
URS-12 is one of uh, a series of models from the 2030 developed by CyberLife to recreate extinct or endangered species. The aim was to equip zoos, uh, particularly in large cities, to allow children to discover animals that no longer existed. Leatherback turtles, several species of great apes, elephants and polar bears were produced rapidly with particular care in reproducing the smallest details in appearance and in appearance and behavior of uh, wild animals. One of these bears was purchased secondhand by Zlatko as a part of his many experiments. Okay, so you get a bit of a backstory on this particular bear as well, which is very cool. Uh, change character. So L1, R1 changes character. Uh, character available to purchase. Show the list. Okay, so yeah, we can kind of go through these and... and you know, if you ever play this, you can go through this in your own time. So very cool bonus content. There's nothing really here that I'm too curious about, to be honest. So I guess this is Kara with the blonde hair. Let's just check. Uh, Kara after Zlatko. Uh, with Zlatko turning out to be not what he seems, Kara once again needs to brace himself for Detroit's Savage Winter Cold. Yeah, so this is pretty cool. You get like a 3D model of the character, which is very cool. Uh, we can do... What is variation? Okay, so variation allows us to change the color of her hair. I believe we had her as... Blonde. Uh, we can move the camera around, hide the details. Okay, so it's kind of like photo mode. Somewhat. This would be very good for thumbnails, I think. This would be very good for thumbnails. We can only get rid of the bottom strip. But yes. There we go. That is Kara. Okay, so let's get back out of here. And continue checking out some of the videos in this section. So we saw the short movie for Kara. There is a debut, uh, debut teaser from 2015. And then there's Discovering Detroit. So let's check this out. When David and Guillaume got back in touch about making Detroit, I wasn't terribly surprised they decided to make it because the fan response was so intense. So it makes sense that they would choose to do that after, after the enthusiasm. It was a challenge and it was just a, an interesting thing to get my head around um, how to approach this character now as a different, much older person and whether or not she had changed. And I'm very happy to say that with Detroit, I've had the opportunity to to see Kara grow so much more than I ever expected. You do the housework, the washing, you cook the meals, and you take care of... God damn it, where the fuck's the gone now? Alice! Alice! I mean, she starts out essentially how she does in Kara in, in a very, uh, not robotic, but you know, android other way. And getting to take this journey where she becomes more and more human as it goes on. You know, and as an actor, that's a, that's a wonderful exploration in every way, whether it's how she sits, her posture, how her voice changes, how emotions change, and how much emotion is based on things like empathy and social experience. And so having, you know, as much material as I got with David to have this huge nuanced arc was really incredible. Why couldn't we just be happy? This experience has been quite different than the experiences I've had shooting film or TV or, or doing theater work. I have 83 dots on my face and a you know, really, really flattering black wetsuit type thing. And you're jumping around with props and it, it's, it's kind of like being a 10 year old imaginative kid, uh, which is fun. There's 80 cameras around us, it's already lit. So we just shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. There's no change of sets. There's no hair and makeup. There's no wardrobe. So we move really fast. And we'll go through about 35 pages in a day. Working in TV or film, we'll probably do six pages a day. It's kind of acting boot camp. It's like working out constantly. I mean, you're, you're doing this thing, and then you got to do something that's completely other back to back to back. And so that kind of process of working is very challenging, but it's also very exciting because you just have to keep coming up with new ideas and your head goes all over the place because you're trying to keep track of basically four different storylines for each different response you shot that girl for fuck's sake it was a machine that looked like a girl yeah i, I know what i should have done i just told you i couldn't all right i'm sorry 
The fact that David Cade, he's telling like many stories interwoven from beginning to end is super complicated and super impressive. And I have no idea how he keeps it all in his head. He's not just the writer or the director who's seeing this from the outside eye. He's also thinking about the player walking through this space. You know, only somebody who really, really loves not the work, but like these characters and these stories and cares about doing something meaningful would invest that much in it. And it's always inspiring to work with somebody who cares that much. My experience with motion capture is this one. And, and I found it sort of terrifying in a way because they said the computer's gonna build you. But then as we got into it, I realized all the elements of it were still artistic. I just dipped into a, a really brilliant setup here. I've never seen anything like it. And this won't turn me into a product because I was playing a character. So, it's wonderful. And the game Detroit comes back because of a revolutionary industrial rebirth. And there's no reason why that can't happen in Detroit because they have such tremendous infrastructure for millions and millions of people who can very easily support, you know, a new industry. The city is really strong and resilient, but the city has also been through so much. You see the damage but it takes that time of kind of, of rebuilding and reinvesting into the city that I think is happening slowly but surely. The potential of Detroit as a city is something that this game does a lot of justice to because it would be easy to look at Detroit as some place that used to be and that's not the case. This game provokes a lot of conversation and reflection on our potential near future engagement with machines. That's what we are to them. This merchandise on display in a shop window. I think that a group that feels marginalized feels like they deserve and have earned access to themselves and the environment around them and are trying to figure out a way to articulate how to get freedom. What was I designed to be? Their slave? Their toy? It plays with your comfort levels. You think that this is fine, you're comfortable with it until something blurs the line and throws you off and now I feel differently about it, whether this should be allowed, should it be banned, should it be encouraged. You're gonna ruin our lives, and for what? For a bunch of machines? They are not machines! They are alive! I'm alive! You're alive! They... they're nothing! There are lots of comparable comparisons to any type of persecution of religion, uh, race, etc., dating way back. It can't just be a video game where you shoot them up or where people make these choices to do whatever. I think that's the whole point. You have the choice, and you can either choose to go in one direction with your character or another. And I think that's gonna be very telling about the gamer, very telling. I think there's gonna be a really strong reaction to, to this game, which has such a strong perspective. I'm that much more proud of it now to get to be a part of it because it's, it's important. In this game, you're actively building and designing the character through thing, not just what kind of shield does he have or what color hair does she have, but like their temperament and the way they deal with problems. The different endings to this game are so radically different based off maybe seemingly insignificant choices in the moment, but like life, they, they all add up. And can't play life again, though. Wow, that's incredible. I'm always very fascinated to, to learn about what actually goes on in, in kind of creating something like that. Imagine how many times they would have to have had to redo the scenes uh, depending on what choices the player makes and just just getting into the mindset of like portraying different avenues that you, you can take as a player. Like, it's incredible. The, the way this whole thing is crafted is actually like when you take a look behind what what's actually gone on to creating it it's like it's it's pretty mind-blowing but let's continue we're gonna watch a little uh meet Kara, marcus and connor so this might be how they came up with the cast i'm not sure but we will find out my name is marcus my name is connor my name is Kara. I am one of them. This is our story. I think who Kara is, or how I would describe Kara, depends entirely upon who's playing her. 
because you have the option to make her multiple different people depending on the choices she makes. But I think she, she does start out incredibly naive, incredibly innocent, and kind of hapless. I'm sure we used to be friends before I was reset. Maybe we can be friends again. She's a person who's characterized, I think, by empathy. She's a person who really, she, she just comes from her heart. You'll never leave me, right? I promise you'll never go. I promise. Kara, Alice! Are you okay? Are you hurt? Wait a minute, leave her alone! Kara, leave her alone! The really beautiful thing that I've, I've had the gift to be able to do is to essentially build a person from the ground up because that's what she's doing throughout the game and with every experience she has and every person she meets she's building you know first emotions and then the sense of judgment and it's sort of an exploration of what it is to be a human don't worry luther and i will be right here david and the creators have painted a really intriguing and engaging picture of a near future uh, where we rely upon androids for a lot of our service class business our the the, uh, the class that serves us that helps us that handles our that is our baristas and our drivers and our housemaids and what is humanity where we tap into it how and why we treat each other the way that we do and um, my character Marcus has a really int intriguing journey becoming deviant realizing that he actually has feelings and human qualities inside of him and it's a really incredible ascension into becoming fully realized and coming to terms with what you actually deserve better than this in life and not only do you want it for yourself but you want it for your peers we've come here to demonstrate peacefully and to tell humans that we are also living beings all we want is to live free you know what this thing dad is not your son it's a fucking machine! I think that a group that feels marginalized, feels disenfranchised, feels like they deserve and have earned access to themselves and the environment around them, then are trying to figure out a way to articulate how to get freedom. Connor is analytical. Connor takes things literally. He starts in the beginning place where he's very mechanical. Uh, he feels nothing inside, of course, and it's all just a system, a protocol that he's executing to get whatever he wants to happen, which is help humans stop deviants and to find the link between deviant androids. You were designed to serve humans, not kill them. What was I designed to be? Their slave? Their toy? Just say, I killed him. Is it that hard to say? Stop it! Stop! But of course, over the course of the story, and depending on the player's choices, Connor can grow in many different ways. He can deviate from that procedure or not. Moment of truth, Hank. Am I a living being? Or just a machine? Brilliant. That just made me realize there's so many scenes that were acted out that we still haven't I haven't seen the light of day uh, in our playthrough. But let's keep moving. Let's check out Detroit, an interactive story. Game after game, we try to um, challenge ourselves. For Detroit, we wanted to, first of all, to write a story that would be incredibly bending which means the most non-linear story that we, we've ever created. And um, we wanted really the player to have the possibility to change the story, change his own journey. When you're writing at Quantic, you're writing for an interactive medium. You know, when you're working in television, you'll put a character in a difficult situation, and you as a writing team will argue about what would that character do. But ultimately, you have to decide what happens, and you just show the audience. What's interesting about interactive drama is you bring the player into that conversation and it changes your job slightly as a writer because your job is to provide a narrative context in which the player can write his own story. You're giving him this kind of narrative Lego that he's going to snap together into his own shape. You also have the ability to make your audience attach themselves to your characters because the audience is in some sense responsible for what happens to the characters. It's just a few cans. Come on, let's go. We have some 
cash now? You used me to steal that money. How could you do that? I trusted you. What is a bit specific about this uh, this scripts is how large they are. Uh, if you take a film script, there are about 100 pages. Uh, but here we have to deal with script that, that is between four and 5,000 pages. Everything becomes bigger because we don't just tell one story, but we tell all the possible stories uh, that can be told within this narrative space. Is that calculated? On act three, our final act, we have around 1,000 different scenarios. And every one of those scenarios has to be as interesting, as passionate, as strong, and as emotional for the player. We want every action that the player does, every interaction that is available to serve in telling the story, and help the player understand who his character is, and build that character moment to moment. We started with the intention pretty early on that we would never lie to the player. So we implemented a visible tree structure in the game that players can consult during a scene or at the end of it, which shows exactly what they did and what they missed. There are games out there offering world exploration. We offer narrative exploration. You know, keeping control of such a, a wide and, and, and large story is is a huge challenge. So. Same thing when you shoot with actors, um, because you will need to shoot many different versions of each dialogue, of each scene. For actors, it's a huge, huge challenge. Because of the style of the game, you have so many different ways that the character can go. Every decision, it's what I call kind of choose your own adventure. Like every decision that the player makes, it's gonna open up 40 more pages of material and experience that ties in, which means as a performer, you have to try to continue to make things feel real that the player might not ever see, but also that in, in performance, it's not always connected to a previous act. It's grueling, it's hard work, but it's a great team and, and I enjoy doing it. I was really frustrated, I was, until I got to this point where I kind of was able to step outside of my own experience and even in a lot of ways my own process and be able to step outside of that and okay, okay, this is something new, what do you need? How do I meet you there? How do I give you what you need and still feel like I'm doing what's right? And once I did that, then all of a sudden it got really fun. It was much freer and uh, having to approach it in a new way and think about the player and think about how it serves them and what I'm doing for them or what I'm letting them into. It's really, I think, uh, helped me grow in general. Remember, there's nothing on the left. That's, that's all. So it's probably all there. And then make a come first, close. But I think you would go first to check that it's safe. OK, sure. The most enjoyable thing about working in performance capture on this kind of project is that if I shot a film, I would get to do one of these endings. I get to do so many different things as Connor. Your head goes all over the place because you're trying to keep track of basically four different storylines for each different response. What's the name of my dog? Buddy? Scout. I think it's Jack. I, I can't remember. So I, I worked with physicality a lot because it was a good way to anchor myself in these different rings of the tree. As the story grows out, I know where that is physically in my body and then I can switch more continually on set and it'll be entirely up to the player to determine what order those things come out and what they look like from a distance. Like if you're playing through it, um, the culmination of all of that will be their version of Connor. I'm faster than you and I don't feel pain. You don't stand a chance against me. Listen, asshole. If it was up to me, I'd throw the lot of you in a dumpster and light a match to it. Tourner les scènes d'action à... Shooting action scenes at Quantic Dream is a real challenge because these are scenes where the storytelling has to continue. It's not an action scene just to have a dose of adrenaline. The stunts have huge consequences on the rest of the story. It's really a moment where we implicate the player and tell him that the choices he makes during an action scene will have a direct impact on the evolution of his story. My biggest challenge on Detroit has been managing the large number of animations that we received from motion capture. Detroit features more than 37,000 animations, which is a huge amount to handle on a daily basis. 
Donc il faut prendre conscience qu'un... You have to realize that the player, in his first playthrough, will miss certain scenes. This also means that we had to think of, conceive, and produce all the potential story paths. The character's costumes, the places, day or night, the weather. Did the character get shot in the shoulder? Did he get injured? All this consistency forced us to produce a lot of graphic assets in order to, quite simply, allow the player to have true continuity throughout the story. Honestly, we were even as surprised by the, the challenges that come with such a big tree structure. And uh, we, did, uh, we did our best to guarantee quality across all the, all the game and make sure that whatever path you choose within this narrative space, you will have an equally good experience. Wow, wow. So between four to five thousand pages of, of script um, compared to a, a regular film script. That's a lot. And 37,000 different animations. Like, it's mind boggling. And even for the actors, the amount of scenes they'd have to kind of reenact or, or kind of get their minds into a certain branching persona. Like, if you're playing connor a certain way you'd have to have they'd have to act out i'm assuming slightly differently than they would if connor was you know if he was more machine or more andrew i don't even i can't even wrap my head around um just the the depth of of work that has to go into to creating something like this so let's look at the making of detroit Detroit Become Human was uh, produced over a period of four years. Here in Paris, we have a team of about 180. We need to add also all the outsourcing with our partners in the Philippines, in China, Vietnam, and in India. So when we started working on this story, I had to um, imagine where Cara was built. And um, for whatever reason, the city of Detroit came very quickly to my mind because it had already an incredible story by itself of, uh, of history and themes. So we traveled there with the team and we were really moved by what we saw and we could really um, feel the desire to fight and, and really uh, be born again. And we just continued this curve, this growth, and just imagine what Detroit would be like if the Android industry was, um, you know, using these huge factories to build androids there. A very strong element in Detroit is that there's a lot of industrial wasteland and a lot of nature too. And for us, the graphic designers, it was an incredible playground. The destroyed zones which we wanted to preserve, we appropriated them to turn into something else. Then in the areas that needed to be rebuilt, we were able to imagine our Detroit of the future. We didn't want to make a science fiction universe, but a world of anticipation. If we chose science fiction, we could have imagined flying cars, extraterrestrials, but those things are very far from our current everyday life. Anticipation is more about gleaning from our contemporary reality, the one we know, because Detroit is set in 2038, and 2038 is tomorrow. The difficulty we had was sticking to reality. That is to say, technology becoming more and more invisible, a lot more elegant, and at the same time, making it visual. So all the computer equipment, autonomous cars, we simply act very technological objects, but at the same time remain very credible and ingrained in reality. To create a cohesive universe in the fashion and clothing of the human characters in 2038, I didn't want to put an accent on strange shapes or really vibrant colors and things we wouldn't know. That I wanted to keep for the androids. The goal was to create something familiar which we can identify with in this future setting. Working on the artistic direction for the androids was a bit special because this is a project about the place they could occupy in the human world. It was out of the question for them to be too beautiful or too perfect. They had to correspond to every social class, rich and poor. Inspired by everyday utilitarian clothes, I brought a modern touch by adding dynamic display surfaces, the armband we can see on the side, the triangle on the front and back, and LED like that, there's no confusion. Wait. You're just an, an android? All right, ma'am. We need you to go. You can't do that. You... Why aren't you sending a real person? Once we cast the actors, we travel to meet them in order to scan their faces. 
We record the structure of their face with the scan. And we record the colors and patches of skin with photography. Once we have this information, we will use this as a basis for modeling and creating the characters. The artist will make it more realistic, but will also enrich it. He will propose ideas which we will develop together. Finally, we will have a character with character who corresponds to the project in the world. When the actors come to Quantic Dream, we show them the design, what their image will be, and what they will look like in the game. This extra information gives them another dimension and color to connect with emotionally. It helps them think about how to play their character. Your mission, that's all you care about, huh? You should consult a professional who can help you. Beat it, you hear me? Get the hell out of here! So there are three types of shoots at Quantic Dream. Shooting and performance capture, where you capture the whole actor, his voice, his face, and his body. These shoots are obviously done with American actors because the game's original version is in American English. After that, there are the body-only shoots, representing around 250 days of filming, while the performance capture is 100 days of filming. Now, body-only shoots, there are two types. There are the action shoots and the technical shoots, which are mokit shoots. Mokit is when the player controls a character on the screen and he moves in an environment to explore it. This is of particular importance at Quantic Dream, and therefore we shoot a lot to offer a unique context for each scene and each character. To prepare a motion capture shoot, we first get together to look at the sets we need, the animations that we want to shoot, which ones need to be grouped together, or which ones need to be cut and shot at another time, so that we get the most out of the shooting day. This often means shooting scenes out of order, especially those with big props or accessories, like a big car, for example. So we shoot all the animations related to that particular prop first. The biggest challenge for the mocap team was shooting a Spider-Man mo-kit. We had to build a wall and attach an actor to a harness with cables so we could pull him up and render him climbing. The shooting on this game total took about, I would say, more than a year, maybe one in two years, with about 300 actors on, on set. So it's, it's quite a massive production. But so much happened on this set between the stunts and the shootings with a little girl and, and all the, these great actors that we had. It was really a, a very, very memorable journey for the team and for myself. Today, Detroit has over 37,000 animations. When we retrieve the motion capture data, it's just a cloud of points, which represent all the markers worn by the actors. From this cloud of points, we have a phase called retargeting, which gives us a skeleton. This skeleton will be applied to the characters of the game. There is still work to be done, but this gives us the main movements. Since we are working on something very realistic, we must recognize the actor and also recover all the emotion he expresses in his performance. We use a system of facts, an identity card for each actor. We make the actor do a whole range of facial expressions. Then we recover all the expressions and paste the animations on a puppet that Jan has prepared. I then recover and refine these poses. I might stretch the lip, reinflate a cheek, tiny details that make the finished product really capture the actor. Because of the nature of our mocap system today, when we receive the animations, we're missing eye movements, and so the character has that dead look. He really has no eyes, so then it's a big part of the work for the animators to find the regard of the actor in relation to his position, in relation to the body, etc. It was crazy when I saw the newest model for Kara, because they've been working on it and working on it, and this was the first time I literally jumped in my seat. It not only looked so much like me, it was the fact that it looked so lifelike. It wasn't that it looked just like it was a camera, it was something else, you know, but it looked alive. It's exciting, and it's kind of terrifying. <laughs> game after game, we learned the rules of, of optics and, and filming. And uh, our goal with Detroit Become Human was to have cameras 
that would actually emulate the optics of a real physical camera. So basically dealing with uh, real-world imperfections was our main task and uh, just to make cameras look as real as we can. Once the animations are shot and processed by the animation department, integrated and polished, we film them. That is to say, we really do a mise-en-scene, as in cinema. The real difficulty of our job is to know if these cameras are telling us something. Are they in the emotion of the scene? Do they describe exactly what the action must convey, what must be felt? The most important challenge for me was one of the final scenes where Marcus decides to start the revolution and go to the battlefield. Very quickly, we imagined this to be a huge sequence shot. We wanted the feeling of a cameraman running behind us while showing Marcus, the androids who help him, the person shooting at us, etc. Above all, it was necessary to say to oneself, this scene is very violent but does not glorify war. On the contrary, that war is something improbable and absurd. It was really a fun challenge. The idea was to say we have three characters. We would like each of them to have a specific cinematography. We wanted Kara to be much more filmed with some kind of handheld camera to have something very uh, living, very breathing. For Connor, we wanted something very cold and very perfect. And for Marcus, we wanted something epic and spectacular. So it was about the, the filming, but it was also about the photography. So we worked with a, with a director of photography to give each character a different lighting, different key colors. Each of them would have their own worlds. And finally, we worked with the composers so they would create a specific sound for each character, so each would have his own world and his own style. I don't even know what to say. There's so much, there's literally so much that goes into it. The making of Detroit, uh, here's the soundtrack. So this is more about the music. We've got a Detroit short about Chloe, one about Luther, one about Zlatko, and one about Kamsky. But I think we'll save those for later. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the soundtrack of Detroit. For the soundtrack of the game, we tried to be very close to what is done in film. We were constantly asking at each place in the game, why are we putting music here? What is it going to say? So we focused the music on bringing emotion, which is interactive and supports the character's arc. I'm sorry, honey. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know I love you, don't you? You know I love you. We make games that are very narrative. We're really into interactive drama, so the soundtrack also had to go in that direction, supporting the three characters' very different stories. We really wanted three colors, three musical sound identities, and from there, having three composers made sense, since the story of Kara, Marcus, and Connor are all completely different. You recognize him? It's Carlos Ortiz. For Connor, we wanted a soundtrack that could be very cold and very um, mechanical, very machinesque somehow. For Kara, we wanted a soundtrack that would be very moving and emotional. It was about the quest for identity, but it was also a journey about love and empathy. And for Marcus, we wanted something epic, some, something that would really represent the grand aspect of his quest. And we were very fortunate to find three incredibly talented composers and uh, working with them has been a dream, honestly. My name is Philip Shepherd and I'm a composer and a cellist and a producer and today we're at Abbey Road Studio One, which is my favourite studio in the world and today we're recording the soundtrack for Cara from The Company. So when I compose a big project, I often travel just to kind of get out you know, and, and get some fresh air and some inspiration. And I go um, hiking and traveling in Montana a lot. I had a, a log fire in the room that I was staying in, and the flames were kind of making absolutely direct music. 
and it became the basis for Cara's theme, and it sounds something like this. Now, over the top of that, I found a little theme that just seemed to fit over the top, which is taking Cara's name, Cara, Cara, and just using like a two-syllable motif, and it sounds like this. time that's fitting over. So he kind of works in lots of levels and in fact every single theme in the score has one of those elements built into it and it becomes sort of the DNA of every single tune. For me, writing this theme for Cara, I actually had to tap in to what it feels like to be a father to daughters. I really had to tap into everything I feel about my daughters and thinking, well, if I had to write music for them and that sense of trying to protect them but also give them the freedom, that's totally where it came from. Because each composer has been given the sort of narrative responsibility for very different characters, I haven't had to sort of go into other styles. I can actually be very loyal to this particular character and sort of hopefully encapsulate her. But it means also I've suddenly become very connected to this character. And if for some reason it goes to game over early, I'm gonna be mortified. <laughs> you know? They're over there! Starting a new project, for me personally, it's always finding the right tone, finding the right color, I like to call it. For me, it's finding that right texture that actually sits against picture really well. One of the biggest things is I created custom instruments for Connor. I pulled out all my vintage synthesizers um, to be able to capture this robotic person, if you will. My approach to uh, all of these custom instruments is that I hear the sound in my head. Um, and either I could just come into the piano and just be like, all right, so I'm gonna just get on the computer and just create it. i rather be able to play these instruments physically. As soon as you see Connor the first time, there is a really interesting um, thematic idea that you hear, and it's that's just made out of a Moog synthesizer, but completely manipulated in multiple ways. And it's it's robotic. It has a little bit of an emotional to it. it he's he's on his mission, so you feel that as well. So it just kind of gives you that cold, motionless, with a mission in hand that you kind of feel throughout the whole thing. As the music evolved, one of the things that I was very weary and I was very kind of uh, focused on was the way that the music has to evolve. So my idea behind it was that Connor is a singular android that could at any point become a deviant or could actually stay as an android. So I created a more or less a uh, Connor theme and then I was able to just manipulate it in different aspects of it. Is everything okay, Lieutenant? Chris was on patrol last night. He was attacked by a bunch of deviants. I'm a human being writing for a robot. And throughout uh, Connor's journey, he meets someone. He meets a partner. So how do you deal with a robot feeling? And I've met a partner that I'm going to work with. Uh, or all of a sudden, he sees a dead body. Does this robot have an imagination? Does this robot have a feeling? And if yes, how do you translate that into non-emotional music? Uh, so it basically, at any point, I was just like, I can't do this. I can't do this. And then I just do it. <laughs> property was damaged, and fires continued to rage in several major districts. Some people are asking, have androids become a threat to our security? 
when I first started really digging in on Marcus, um, the one thing that I really try to capture was the transformation process. You know, Marcus is this android that evolves over the course of the game and, and really goes from kind of figuring out that he's more than just an android. You know, he's starting to develop kind of a human soul in a, in a way. Try to imagine something that doesn't exist, something you've never seen. Now concentrate on how it makes you feel and let your hand drift across the canvas. On the other side of Marcus that I really latched onto was that he almost became a savior for a lot of the other androids in the game. So when I started developing the theme for Marcus, I really made it like a church hymn. I wanted it to be very simple. I wanted to make it a chordal melody. I really wanted to make it almost like a Bach hymn. The tough thing with that is it had to be recognizable. If I made it too complex from a harmonic standpoint, it would be hard, I think, for people to kind of pick it out and recognize it. It's very acoustic derived, but it's, it's also been treated with a lot of uh, effects and things to kind of put it into the space that I, I, I felt the sound should be in. It can be beautiful, it can be haunting, it can be extremely powerful um, from an action standpoint, um, and I'm really happy with the way it turned out. The music is, um, is there, but it's subliminal and it's emotional and people are, are, are feeling it and it's not distracting. And that's tricky with a game like this where you have to have a lot of ins and outs like that where, where the music kind of has to get in and out of these moments. This is a war we're fighting with the humans. If we fail, they'll destroy us. I think the game's been put together so well where I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't ruining the emotion. I gotta be honest, when we first started on this path, I said, oh man, this could be pretty messy, you know? I mean, it could feel disconnected and... But I mean, it's amazing how they really guided us and got us to really kind of all be in the same world, but at the same time feeling completely different. So it's really going to stand out and kind of be one of those games where um, people are really going to notice the music and kind of how it was crafted and, you know, and all the hard work that went into making, being able to pull it off in a graceful way. Okay, that was pretty <clears throat> it's it's a lot to take in from everything from the music to the animation to the direction to the script to the actors it's a lot and it's uh it, it's it's an amazing piece of work we've got a couple of other things here uh, in terms of the shorts but i think we'll save that for another bonus video so if you guys have kind of enjoyed this so far um Stay tuned, stay tuned. So we've done the soundtrack of Detro Detroit. And yeah, I think on that note, I'm just going to say thank you for giving me some time. And uh, if you enjoyed this deeper dive into the world of Detroit, stay tuned. Because we're, we're probably going to do one more video. We're going to do some sh Detroit shorts with some of the characters. So it'll be a nice uh, video to watch along to. Um, and yeah, thank you for watching this on the YouTube and if you're on YouTube know that I'm currently moving along the path towards 100 subscribers So I ask would you kindly hit the notification bell and subscribe on YouTube And if you liked what you saw click me a thumbs up and whilst you're doing all that you might as well leave a comment with your thoughts below I'd love to hear from you and be sure to check out the rest of the video series and I look forward to you joining me again